like I said, both these guys are legends. They've been in the game longer than I've been alive. And I'm super excited to learn from you guys today and, uh, you know, be able to share this with all those out there that are looking to improve their coaching and their facilities. So with that being said, we'll jump into the first question and kind of let you guys add it. Uh, the first question we have today is how does speed training differ for team sport coaches compared to performance coaches training at a facility? And what are some of the constraints of each? I, I coach about 40 kids. Uh, and I think I oftentimes say I'm a group coach. Uh, uh, Chris Corfus, my business partner, uh, he also coaches a, a large group of kids. But I bet you throughout the year, 90% of his training is in groups of one to three kids in his basement. That type of training is much different than group. I think you 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 coach towards the norm more with a group. You have to. You're forced to. The other thing is, I, I think that we're we're very limited by the constraints of our facilities. Uh, I I'm lucky enough to have about a seventy to eighty meter stretch uh, on a track. It seems really small to me when when the courts are being used by badminton and the curve is used by wrestlers and the other curve by cheerleaders and the girls track teams on the other straightaway, but we're blessed to have a long straightaway. And I know that many facility owners do not have that. If I ever owned a facility, obviously I would, um, <laughs> there, there's a Walmart that's been closed down a couple of miles from my house. And I think that would be a great facility to have a weight room and a long stretch where you could sprint. Yeah, so I, I think Tony kind of hits it on the head. There's a big difference. If you're a sport coach, you may have a bunch of teams, a bunch of positions. You've got game strategy. You've got lots of other things that you have to worry about besides team speed if you're the sport coach. And if you're the performance coach, you're generally going to be limited by, as Tony said, your facility. Like for us in the Northeast, we're limited. We have exactly 40 yards. Our building is 120 feet long, but that's all we have. That's room to, to accelerate, decelerate, so we can never run – for us, and we've got a fairly large building. It's not Walmart, but it's pretty big. So we can run a 15-yard fly 10. So we can basically run a 25 and have enough room to decelerate. But that is the limit of our ability during the course of the, whatever, the colder months when we can't get outside. We have some turf space outside. We can get outside and maybe get to to 20-yard fly in length. So there's lots of stuff that you have to think about. And I think hopefully what I want people to get out of this is to figure out what you can do. What can you do? Someone said to me, I, I've got some great video of my friend Devin McConnell's guys at UMass Lowell doing fly tens. And they weren't actually, they weren't, I, I'm lying, not fly tens. They were just doing tens. And the reason they were doing tens was because that was all he had room for in his room. He could run a 10 in his room from a standing start and get enough room for that guy to slam into a crash pad in the room. So that's what he did. And so I think we've got to focus on the what can I do versus what I can't do. And hopefully we'll eliminate a lot of excuses for people in the course of the next hour. Yeah. And I, I would add to that that one of my favorite sayings is always do the next best thing. You know, that that if, if you can't do the best thing, do the next best thing. If you can't do that, you're just constantly figuring out a way to get the job done with what you have. Yeah, yeah, mine the Maya Angelou quote is the one I like. Do the best you can with what you have where you are, right? I mean, that's right. that's really what we've got to think about. Do the best job that you can do with what you have where you're at. And I think as coaches, too many of us make excuses. And what I find, and, and I'll be the one to badmouth strength coach, so I'll save Tony from doing it, but strength coaches love to make excuses for why they can't do the performance-related stuff and they just have to lift. I wrote, I just wrote a new book. And one of the things that I said, when you're designing your facility and your new book, and this is really based on what I learned from Tony, whatever, five, six, seven, eight years ago, whenever we first connected was the number one thing you need is as much sprint space as possible. You got to figure out what's the longest straightaway I have in my facility. And then you've got to make that straightaway unencumbered so that you can run some sort of sprint because some sprint is better than no sprint. I don't care. People say, oh, it's too acceleration. Dark. People love to bullshit around about stuff. I'm like, I don't really give a shit, to be perfectly honest. What I want you to do is run as fast as you can in the space that you have. If you're doing three-yard sprints with a one-yard fly-in, I am absolutely good with that if that's what your facility limits you to because that's way better than people not running sprints. Love it. Yeah, I, I'm in a similar as you, Mike. Now I've got about 35 yards that we can run. And 
obviously we have speed labs all over that have different distances and it's all about just getting in what you can get done. So that's a great answer. Love that. Second one. What's one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you were early on in your career? Go ahead, Mike. I'll start. Keep my mouth shut. <laughs> I wish I'd, I wish I'd known what a dick I probably was when I was younger. And if I'd just been a little bit quieter and been a little bit nicer, I probably would have learned a lot more faster. Yeah, but you know, I, I think that there's a place to be a dick too. You know that the that the um, that the ability to stand up for yourself when you're young is is somewhat important. You know, you don't want to be a shrinking violet. You know, when when you're a young guy trying to trying to you know convince people to do things. Um, th this could be when I saw this this question, I, I thought, damn, this, this probably should be an article I write. But um, to really come up with three things. Uh, the first thing is my first 20 years of coaching, I did not value recovery. Well, I actually did. The day after a game, I valued recovery. And I think I valued recovery pregame to the game. So I surrounded the game with recovery, but then I made my practices harder than games. And when you make practices harder than games or, or track practice harder than a track meet, and you never recover from that, that's an endless spiral downhill performance-wise. And then secondly, it goes along with it. Not only do you need recovery, but you need less to recover from. Uh, you know, that that I think I burned the stake every day at practice. I was like that crazy craps player um, that, that that brought his uh, 100 bucks to the craps table and tried to win a 1,000 and ended up going broke. And I think that you know, it was all good intentions. I wanted to get the most out of practice, but I, I burnt the stake doing it. And then the third thing is to stop making practice the hell you have to go through to get to the heaven of a game or a contest or a competition. And so I, I'm a true believer in, in, in gamifying practice. And to me, that means two things. One is you make it more like the game or and or you make it more like a game where you measure things, you make things competitive, you, you make practice or working out something that kids look forward to. Yeah, I guess I, I would agree. You know, I think that the stuff that we get stuck in now is stuff, you know, we get here, the David Goggins stuff and the Mamba mentality. And all, I mean, all that stuff, it all sounds really, really good. It all plays great in Sports Illustrated. It makes for great sound bites. It does not make for good training. It does not make for productivity. And I think it was Tony, I guess sometimes maybe you do like people who reinforce the way that you're thinking. But if I could look at it now and think you've got to develop the ability to be adaptable and to look, I look at our athletes now, our business, everything that we're doing is completely different from when we started because almost everybody that we deal with is doing this stuff year round and is overscheduled and we used to be really adamant about kids. You got to get in three days a week. You got to get in four days a week. You got to do this. But the the stressors on these kids has changed so drastically over the last, say, 10 to 20 years where generally speaking, and I know I learned a lot from coaching my own kids, but we were almost always, strength and conditioning was almost always the second thing they had to do that day athletically, not counting six or seven hours of school, but there was going to be another practice. So one thing, we don't do very much conditioning at all anymore to the point, sometimes almost none because these kids are getting so much stimulus. We may do a little bit of harder interval stuff to top things off a little bit, but we used to, like Tony said, we used to be 300 shuttle people and we'd be, you know, we'd finish every workout with conditioning and we'd condition hard, but we were conditioning kids hard who that was the only conditioning they did during the week. That's very different from a kid who, might have my son and his friends it would not be unusual for them to have lacrosse one night and hockey three days or four days during the fall and then lift twice. So they had at least six or seven athletic contacts that they were going to go through during the course of that week. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. Uh, number four, an athlete uh, comes to you and they say they want to start seeing better results on the field. AKA they want to get faster, more explosive. How would you approach training them? Well, I would, um, I mean, everybody kind of knows, knows my answer before I say it, but you know, speed is the tide that lifts all boats that when you train the extreme, you train the range that 
that when we learn to run really fast and push our CNS to be the best it can be, uh, all movement comes with it. That that means backwards movement. That means change of directions. Uh, every type of movement. My fastest guys running backwards, and I've timed them, are my fastest guys running forward. And that's because the CNS controls movement. So the idea that we are going to prescribe something that does not include speed would be an absolute wrong. And many, many, um, uh, usually because of space constraints, um, or maybe because people fall in love with the weight room and, and um, they, they want to believe that the weight room can take them everywhere, anywhere, champions are born in the weight room, all those things, that they're resistant to the most important thing in sports, which is movement. And I, I think that sprinting is one type of movement, but the other type of movement is, is what I call bounce. And that's reactive force. And then the other thing is jumping high and jumping far, which is to me, explosive force. I, I am not anti-weight room, but I have to talk like this a lot in today's world because many weight rooms are anti-movement. Uh, I would simplify it a little bit more. If a kid said to me, hey, you know, I really want to get better. I really want to do this. I would say, show up, go to sleep at night and listen. Because I don't, if you came in, I always tell everybody, you could come into our facility and you could see, and I'm not being hyperbolic, but you could watch the best lacrosse player in the world train and the best women's ice hockey player in the world train and some high school kids train and somebody's mom train. And you wouldn't see the training be that much different. The one big difference would be our adults don't sprint. Our kids, like I, I, I adopted Tony's concept at least wholeheartedly. We sprint at least two of the three days that we're in the room. And if we're in the room four days, we sprint two of the four days, at least timed sprinting. So I, I'm a, I'm a hundred percent in agreement with Tony in terms of time sprinting has to be part of what you're doing. But I also think, I believe I I'm still, I'm a weight room guy. You got to lift. But as the thing that Tony emphasized is that the weight room has, is a means to an end. It is not the end. When you watch most people's weight room program, that's the end. We're going to get really good in the weight room. I, I look at the weight room and think I want the weight room. If I'm, if I'm not getting, either larger because that generally tends to help most people or faster or increasing my vertical jump, then the weight program is not being very productive. I can live with a kid getting faster or not getting faster and not increasing his vertical. If he gains 20 pounds, my son and his friends did had a couple of years like that where they were going through puberty and they were getting bigger. And I was thinking, I want to keep them at the speed that they're at because ultimately power wise, if we go back, you know, now people have taken to calling it uh, truck stick, but what, how, however you want to look at that, that measure of, of speed and body weight, if you want to look at that, I, I called it, actually, I called it the man uh, formula. And then, oh my God, what's his name? Uh, Dan Baker was at a seminar. Then he said, I told Brian Mann that. He said, it's, it's the Dan Baker formula. I said, okay, we'll call it the Baker formula now either way. But it's basically looking at, are you increasing, you know, whatever mass specific force? And, if I'm getting that, then we're being productive. If I'm in the weight room per se, and we're just, maybe we're lifting heavier weights. I don't know if that's necessarily the answer. And if you look at too many people, like when I look at the still people that are still powerlifting, I think, I mean, that to me, you know, powerlifting, bodybuilding, whatever, it, it makes no sense at all. You've got to be looking and thinking, am I doing a sports performance oriented strength and conditioning program? That's what these guys should be doing. Love it. Okay, next we got, what are three things that will make the biggest impact on a performance coach working with athletes to improve their speed? And I want to take that from the lens of, for coaches, what would be some recommendations for coaches when they're working with their athletes uh, on their speed? I'm going to answer for Tony. First would be timed sprints. Second would be time sprints. And third would be timed sprints. If you said to me three things, they were going to <laughs> if, seriously, if you're not tight, like, cause people always say, well, I don't, you know, I don't have money to get a timer. I'm like, okay, then you really, I listened to your atomic speed workout today, Tony, to prep for this. But the reality is if you are a performance coach and you have not bought a timer yet, I don't care if you buy an arena gear or you buy a, um, you know, uh, whatever, buy what you want. But if you don't have a timer and you can't time, then you're not 
you're not going to be nearly as effective. That is, that is, if I said what I learned from Tony Holler, that's what I learned from Tony Holler. I, it's, it's, I, I totally agree. Obviously uh, I couldn't have said it better. Uh, the one thing that I've gotten uh, really deep on in the last five to 10 years, and I think it's central to the feed the cats approach is I think it comes also from me being a teacher and seeing how miserable high school students are in high school and, and, and how I reject the fact that, you know, school doesn't have to suck. And my chemistry class did not suck. And, and I told my kids on the first day of, of class that I want this to be your favorite class. And I want me to be your favorite teacher. And I think, I don't know if my sports bled into the classroom or my classroom bled into my sports, but I think that if you're making practice the best part of a kid's day and they look forward to it, you're going to get more out of them. And uh, and that was not the case the way I grew up. And uh, so I think that's an important part of, you know, if we can just get kids to fall in love with training, I, I think that um, they always have loved the games. But if they fall in love with training, they'll take themselves for, further. Yeah, I would say. And one thing I've realized is that Timing is gamification. We bought, we have an arena uh, gear timer and we bought the scoreboard. Best thing we ever did was buy the scoreboard. <laughs> People love the freaking scoreboard. 100%. You know, they look, they they run through, they look up and they see their time. I mean, there's nothing better. And between that, I would say to every, if you're a sports performance coach and you're on here, you got to get a timing system and you got to get a jump mat. And people always, people argue about, oh, John, you know, he cheated, he lifted his knees. I look at people think, I don't give a shit what he does. I, if he gets his highest vertical jump and he lands in a half squat on the mat, cool. I just got 100% effort. I got that guy to figure out how it's the longest I've ever suspended myself in the air, which is what I'm trying to get him to do. I'm not worried about me comparing my numbers and saying, oh, look, I had this kid and he got a 40 or this kid got a 30 or whatever. I'm gamifying power. I'm gamifying speed. These kids love gamification. My guys love we. I could just, we would have time sprints all day. My guys would run time sprints for as long as I would allow it to go on. And they do, they take, they put their shoes on, they take their shoes off. Our guys figure out, they put their feet on the wall and push off the wall. They, I always watch them and I'm thinking, who's going to think of what next to try to figure out a way to make this thing faster? And, you know, guys, it's it's just fun to watch and they're having a blast. It's not it's the furthest thing from boring that you could possibly be. And some, I, I quote you on all the time, Mike is it's, is that you mentioned that speed training, and this is important maybe for our audience, because maybe a lot of weight room people say, I don't know enough about sprint mechanics to coach speed. That's not my lane. And then you make the statement that when you start timing and gamifying performance and that kind of stuff, that kids will organically experiment, be successful, fail, focus on the successful. They will organically improve. Yeah, that I, I, people argue the self-organization thing all the time. I am 100% certain. I, I have a great video that I show in all my presentations of my son and all his friends. They all look exactly the same running after a certain point in time because all of them have figured out how to do it. I just posted a picture of my son running down the field in lacrosse. And he's in a pretty good sprint position. You'd look at the good sprint position. We don't coach that a lot. We don't talk about it a lot. We talk a lot about pushing the ground. We don't do a lot of quote unquote sprint drills. We don't really do any. We we would call it warm. It's kind of like your atomic speed program. That stuff's warming you up. Yeah, we're doing that. Yeah. But it's not with the intention of I want you to do X and I want you to be robotically here. I used to teach that. You know, there's two slits, your hands are going into them, reach back in your pocket. I did all that stuff. I mean, I've been 40 years. I got really good at doing everything wrong. And the one thing I realized was when you put the timer out, guys quickly figure out, okay, that didn't work. I long strided that one out. That didn't work. The other thing you realize is that sometimes fast people don't do it right. My fastest female is a girl named Alex Carpenter, who's uh, second right now in the women's professional league in goals. And she's just an absolute beast. Her father was a first round pick in the NHL draft. I mean, she can do seven chin ups with a 45 pound plate. She can bench, you know, 135 for probably 10, 15 reps. She's just an animal. But everybody who watches her run thinks, aren't you going to fix that? And I'm like, nope. She's running a 
you know, 20 yard fly 10. I think she's around 106, which for a female is fast. It's fast as I've seen. It's like what our AHL men sometimes run. And I'm not fixing it. It's like, okay, it's got some rotary stuff to it. It looks a little funky side to side. Oh, well, I think we, we can, uh, we can spend way too much time fixing things that aren't broken and trying to be really smart ourselves. And I don't think that works. Not in the long run. And just to add with the gamifying training, you know, we've gamified all of our lactate workouts now as a track coach. We don't do any workouts that are not measured and not recorded, ranked and published. And once again, that, that adds a new significance to a workout that used to just be miserably hard. Now, now they, they perform in that workout. We don't have to ask for effort. They perform because we record, rank, and publish. My mind also went to Bobby Stroop, who trains Patrick Mahomes, and they've gamified med ball throws. They go med miles per hour on med ball throws. Uh, they, they've gamified swinging a baseball bat, swing it left, swing it right. They, they go miles per hour on that. You know, you could, if you're really creative, you can find ways to create performance level outputs in a workout. And I think that's where we get better. I don't think we get better with moderate exercise. I think we get better when we're getting after it. Yeah, we've been taught that it's repetition. Yeah. And it's probably not repetition, but effort that does it. And we haven't, we've played with the med balls with the radar guns. We've also played, but I said, I was talking to one of my friends who coaches lacrosse and I said, it, you know, she's like, what should I do? I said, well, I'd have three stations. I'd have a sprint station. I'd have a jump station and I'd have a shooting station where they shoot with the radar gun I said, because same thing, you know, shoot people that shoot hard tend to score more goals. People that run fast tend to score more goals. It's, it's not, it's not literally not rocket science. Perfect. I uh, resonate with that one too, just as our journey as a facility, spending way too much time on technical drills in the beginning and now getting to the point where it's just like, let's run fast. So totally um, as a younger coach, that's something I made that mistake as well in the beginning. Well, especially being time constrained, if you're running a business now, Tony's trying to cut track practice shorter, even though he probably has as much time as he wants for us we would like to have somebody there for an hour because that's the, a really good business model. And so some people think, well, you know, why don't you do 10 sprints? And I'm like, cause we don't have time to do 10 sprints and we can't cycle our people through. We do two to four because that's what we got time for. And some of it is just looking logistically and saying, okay, what, what works in my particular environment? Yeah, Absolutely. So next one, how do you approach speed training differently based on a child's age and development stage? For me, it's uh, no different, uh, zero different. I've had five-year-olds, uh, uh, literally my five-year-old son doing speed training at a, at a speed camp alongside a starting linebacker for uh, Northwestern who later played in the NFL with the Vikings. Um, we are doing the same things. I mean, it's, I, I have grandsons that they were doing speed drills, you know, uh, they were doing jumps and bounds and things like that when they were three. Now, now they're doing them better now that they're six and seven, but, but, but they were doing them all along. Uh, you talk about gamifying training, a, a, a four-year-old will, will, will race like heck and will also race like heck when he's getting timed. So any type of competition or timing um, will, will just really light them up. I mean, I, I had a birthday party for my oldest son. I think it was his 10th birthday party or something where we had an Olympic party where all, all we did was contests and the kids loved it. They threw things, they sprinted, you know, they, they we had a little high jump bar with a tiny high jump mat and then they would jump over the bar um, Kids love competition. You know, the people say, oh, push, let, let them play, let them play, stop organizing. Well, you can organize a game too and make it fun without having to travel across the country with a uniform or something. So um, so I, I think you can train all ages. 
Yeah, I, I would view it only slightly differently. One, I would say, yes, I wouldn't do anything different from the youngest kid that we take. We don't tend to take kids before 11 because I think as a private sports performance facility, one of the things I always say is I don't want to be in the childhood stealing business. And I think there's a bunch of people who are in the childhood stealing business where anybody that'll pay, they'll take their kid and start training them. And kids, I don't think kids below, you know, under 11 need to be around people like me personally. That's my own opinion. Other people can, can think differently about it because almost invariably, I will tell you this with nearly 100% accuracy, every kid that shows up under the age of 11 is accompanied by a crazed parent crazed like some <laughs> lunatic who thinks that their kid <laughs> is going to be the next whatever and i love actually I, I take great joy in turning those people away and saying hey next year at 11 we'll let them come and guess what you can't come with them and you can't watch because that's our rule it, it's like no no parents allowed you can't stand around and you can't have any input and i always tell them if they don't like that you can find somebody else who will take your money because there's a lot of us out there and we'll all take your money. It just depends on how good you want it to be. But we, like I said, 11, 12 is when kids start getting caught. And that's when I think they need to start learning about training and realizing that, okay, there's going to be some extra that gets involved here. Up to 11, I think kids, you're way better off playing another sport probably than you are doing a strength and conditioning program because that general athleticism window is going to close relatively rapidly. And I'd rather have kids playing baseball and playing lacrosse and playing hockey and playing football and playing soccer and doing whatever than spending three hours a week with me worrying about whether their squat form is perfect. I, I really agree with that too. And, and once again, I'm, I was kind of thinking in terms of, of, a, of a grandparent and my own uh, grandsons and things like that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm talking more like, like racing out in the street or, or, uh, or, Hey, you want to go to the track today? And, and bring a couple of your buddies and, and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do a little track meet or something like that. Um, I think that, uh, that any type of formal training or formal travel sports uh, for kids that are under 10 or something kind of nauseates me. Yeah. I used to have, I used to call it with my kid, the, uh, this is probably politically incorrect, but I used to call it the ADD Olympic games where we just go in the gym and we do five minutes of everything under the sun. We'd make an obstacle course and we'd run it for five minutes and then we'd hit wiffle balls for five minutes and then we'd kick the soccer ball for five minutes because that was about the end of his attention span at that particular time. And about the time he dropped whatever the implement was, I'd find another implement. But that was play. That was us. We spent a lot of Sunday afternoons when it was cold and rainy. But the fact that we had some AstroTurf and a wall made things much better. Sounds like uh, my track practice today. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So what are some key strategies for keeping youth or young athletes motivated and excited about training? Uh, obviously, we talked about uh, timing, gamifying, but is there anything outside of that uh, elements that you guys have found to keep them engaged and motivated? Um, I would say one, don't make it suck. Tony's talked about that. Uh, again, because I, again, I think so many of us as adults, we want to duplicate the way that we were coached as kids with this sort of hard ass mentality and again i'm a i'm in most of the time i am a private business person the vast majority of my time people have to want to come that's just the reality of the situation so one being being nice being happy showing an interest in kids all that stuff we spend a lot of time with our coaches on the soft skill part we select our coaches for soft skills i've got no dickheads no meatheads no they just i don't have them our people are all really, really genuinely nice people that you would want to spend an hour with. And I think in fitness, strength and conditioning, whatever, we've got way too many kind of narcissistic clowns who are worried about themselves and not really worried about. I always say, if you're worried about your training, I'm prob you're probably not the right person for me. If you're worried about other people getting better, you're probably the right person for me. Yeah, I don't think with my coaching staff, I don't think there's anything that we do uh, that's more important than what we do for 15 or 20 minutes before practice and after practice, where we we come early, we talk individually to kids, we stay later, talk individually to kids, we make connections, we, we find out what's stressing them out, all those things. And that really tells them that you love them. And uh, when you love somebody, you know, they love you back usually. And with with training, 
I just don't think we'll ever be very good at something that we don't fall in love with. And, um, and falling in love is not something um, that removes the fact that hard things are going to be necessary. But I think when you love something, you're willing to fight through the hard things. And, and I think that people who are really passionate about something are, are, are some of the best fighters in the world. And so, so if we can turn on that switch, then, you know, kids start buying in to everything we say, they start reading, they start building their own house, they start sleeping at night. And uh, I think that's a key. Perfect. This, this is one that I actually uh, put on here. I was excited to hear from you guys on this. When it comes to developing coaches on your staff, what are some of the top tips or processes you've implemented to help improve your coach's performance? I think Mike, I've already kind of addressed that. I, I love the, um, what do you, you call it? Soft skills, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. And I, um, what, what my mind goes back to, you know, like, you know, when you see people doing a hard job and, and they, they seem uh, to still be happy in their job, you know, we, we all have to learn how to do that. That's just part of being a worker and, and having, having a, a decent life um, instead of focusing on the negative, you focus on the positive. And my mind goes to um, uh, Dick Vitale, what he used to say all the time back in the eighties, when I cared about college basketball, about the three E's, the energy, excitement, enthusiasm. You know, that if you have the three E's as an athlete, you're a pretty damn good athlete and you better have those as a coach as well. And I think a lot of coaches, um, um, uh, work too long and too hard and are too stressed and they 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 have to have fake energy um they have to fake excitement and they have to fake enthusiasm and i think kids really see authenticity and they um and they they also see the opposite yeah it, it just goes back like i said soft skills the uh, and i say it all the time i use the quote they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care i really believe that that you're not going to make inroads with kids if they don't think that you like them. And that goes double for young females. And I, they definitely are more, they respond much better to people that are nice, to people that like them. I think young males are a little more used to getting whipped <laughs> and you know, having coaches that are assholes. Whereas young girls sometimes they can think like, why are you yelling? Why are you being mean? And, and they just, it's kind of foreign to them. I also, the other thing with us though is, we are adamant, everybody that works for us at interns has to do the workouts because there's a great, I don't know if anybody's read Kurt Hester's Rants of a Strength and Conditioning Man, Madman besides me, Tony, as he's laughing, but Kurt is great. And he talks about the fact that most strength coaches can't even demonstrate drills. Most strength coaches are, look, you know, I always said, it's literally like, you know, William the Refrigerator Perry, you know, you've got this, you know, person, and actually I shouldn't say that, the refrigerator actually could move. So I, I'm, I'm referring more to the actual refrigerator, but you've got these guys that are weightlifters and they can't demonstrate sprints and they can't demonstrate jumps and they can't demonstrate unilateral exercises. Our coaches have to be able to move. That is the ultimate requirement for them. If you want to coach, you've got to be able to demonstrate. And we get some who come in who aren't great in the beginning and it takes them a while, but we really teach them that for us, I really like when I get track kids that are interested in strength and conditioning, because they generally tend to be really good movers. So as a, as a general rule of thumb, the people I tend to like the least tend to be the weightlifters, which is crazy. But when you get someone who really, you know, I'm a power lifter or I'm a bodybuilder, I always think, Oh my God, another freaking robot who's not going to be able to, you know, get out of the way of a moving train. And, uh, and that's for us, 50% of what we're doing is stuff that does not involve the basics of strength and conditioning. So you got, if you're coaching, you better be able to throw medicine balls and look like an athlete and you better be able to jump over hurdles and look like an athlete and you better be able to run a sprint and look like an athlete and you better be able to do whatever, a lunge or a one leg squat or whatever it is to, to look athletic. Yeah, I mean, it's sad. I, I was looking back, I was thinking the other day that my two biggest sources of information like back in the 80s were muscle magazines like Muscle and Fitness and Flex and then, and then Runner's World. And, you know, I subscribed to those magazines. And and I was thinking that almost morphed into the S and C uh, profession, and and I was thinking, my God, you know how twisted I was learning about how to get you know like to pose and power lift and body build, 
and then to learn how to run marathons. Um, that, that everything I've come to um, in the last 10 to 20 years of my life has been has been totally devoid of all that crap I read back in the 80s. Um, everything is new to me. Yeah, that's, I always feel like I was so lucky to have stumbled into uh, Charlie Francis Training System very early, that book. At that time, it was called the Charlie Francis Training System after the, the, the scandal. He changed the name to Training for Speed, but it was the same book. But I remember reading that book and thinking, wow. And it still reinforced the strength part because Johnson yeah. was a strength guy. But I, and I often think now if I could have, at that time, if I could have read that book and understood a lot of what he was saying from a training perspective, and then also been able to look back at Carl Lewis and think, why is this skinny guy having the same success as the really muscular guy? Because that's the thing that I always highlight in my presentations. When you look at Lewis and Johnson, you say, okay, they don't look anything alike. They don't train anything alike. They're, they're very divergent in personality and appearance. What's the commonality between those two guys? Sprints, right? Sprints. And then you look and think, hey, it's got to be sprints, right? That's because that's, one guy, wait, you know, Lewis didn't like the weight room. wasn't a wasn't a big weightlifter. He was a leg extension, leg curl, calf raise kind of lifter. And then the other guy was, you know, squat, power clean, could bench press, whatever, 400 pounds. You look at the times and the splits, almost identical. And you think, well, what were they doing? What's the common thread between those two guys? Which I always said, the, I did my first presentation after uh, listening to Tony and I called it 30 years at the train station waiting for my ship to come in. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So with the breadth of content being shared on social media and other platforms, what are some tips on sorting through the noise and other examples of organization individuals you guys like to continually learn from? I think first of all, that you, you better read a lot. And, you know, I, I've read over a thousand books in my life and, and um, maybe only 50 of them uh, were coaching books. Uh, the rest were novels and war and peace and all kinds of things. And I think that the more we read, the more balanced we get, the more we are empathetic with other viewpoints. So then the second thing is to read stuff like I read um, the book Squat Every Day. Um, people might be shocked to hear you know, that there was actually a book called Squat Every Day. But I read Squat Every Day and... Uh, I actually got the uh, saying out of it. I changed squat to sprint. I said uh, sprint as fast as possible, as often as possible, while staying as fresh as possible. What he said in that book was squat as often as 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 much as possible, um, as often as possible, staying as fresh as possible. So anyway, my point is, you you read stuff that you may disagree with, just because you want you know to. Uh, uh, to learn what the whack jobs out there are saying about things. And what we find is they usually say some things that the Venn diagram is a little bigger than we think. And then I, I, the other thing that I tell coaches constantly is I know you go to clinics. I know you hear webinars, you do present, you know, you hear presentations, but go visit people. You know, what people do and what people present are oftentimes very different. Um, one's very sterile and, and, you know, like formal, uh, I don't think mics are, I, I'm not that way when I present, but when people come and visit me, they kind of shake their head. Sometimes they say, is this all you do? And I'm like, yeah. And you know, they'll be like, I thought for sure you're holding out, you know, like there was some secret sauce to it. And they say, you know, I could do this. I, I could do exactly what you do. And I'm like, no shit. You know, that's why it's good mm -hmm. to visit people. Yeah. I would agree. I'm like Tony. I've read. I don't. I don't know if it's a thousand, but it's a lot. I always. I've always been a reader ever since I was a kid. So, I love to read. I think the other thing you've got to have a good bullshit detector. You've got to look at this and think: Is this what this person? I would say: Is this what this person does for a living? If they spew shit on the internet for a living, then don't worry about them. You want to be looking at people and saying because I remember the thing. I I always someone told me one time. Look for success in odd areas. Mm -hmm. and I remember this. So with Tony, I said, okay, there's a high school chemistry teacher in Chicago who has the fastest high schooler 
in America right now. That shouldn't be happening. Everybody says, you know, you got to be in Florida, blah, 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 or all this stuff about speed. And you say, why is this happening? I need to go look closer at what Tony Holler is doing because something that he's doing is working correctly. I remember that with uh, Don Chu one time. Somebody said the same thing. Don Chu was every year, Don Chu, who again, you know, people say whatever, the father of plyometrics, however you want to look at it. But Don was a practicing physical therapist who coached track at Division Three Cal State Northridge. And every year he had a couple of jumpers in the Division One championships. And I remember thinking, okay, wait a second. This guy's at a Division Three school in, in, you know, not a big name place in California. And for some reason he's having guys in the Division One nationals every single year. I need to go find out more about this guy. You need to be looking around versus the people that are out there screaming, look at me, look at me, look at me. Those are the guys. And and again, and it's really hard because, the, and I, I wish I could, I always think maybe someday before I totally check out of this thing, I'm just going to out all the clowns and I'm just going to start going on the internet every day and saying, this guy's an idiot <laughs> and he's never coached anybody. And this guy's an idiot and he's never coached anybody. But when people are showing you videos of them coaching somebody like in their bedroom or in their garage or something, you have to ask yourself that. There are guys like Corpus who is doing it in the basement of his house and being really successful. There are not many. And you you just have to be a, a better bullshit detector. And, and we're not. I know some of these guys that have gone out and presented to NFL teams who are totally full of shit and somebody literally got duped on the internet by this guy <laughs> and then went out and hired him and brought him in to to do a presentation on training. It happens way more than it should. Awesome. Um, how do you guys communicate with parents to align goals and create a supportive environment for a young athlete's development? Well, my mind's, yeah, it's one of the worst things I do is deal with parents. Um, I, um, uh, we don't have a bad relationship, but you know, I often say that uh, a track team with a track team, I coach orphans because parents don't seem real interested in track. They don't, they don't go to meets. Whereas like they'll, they'll have 18 family members go to their six-year-old's T-ball game, you know, and, and it's just track is a little different, but I do have a really good informative website. And I, I really put a lot of information on there. And so parents that are really interested can usually find answers there before they have to directly contact me. I also encourage kids to have relationships with me so their parents don't have to. But the third thing is, you know, I, I mean, I published my cell phone on online. I mean, if you Google what's Tony Holler's cell phone number, it comes right up. So I'm very accessible as well. I always answer texts and emails and things like that. But, um, but no, I, I don't, that's not one of the things I'm really good at. I'm probably the same. One of the things I am just honest, I'm very accessible. I answer every text. I answer every email. There's probably not, I don't probably get as many parents bothering me about stuff. Usually the parents that are bothering you are the crazies. And sometimes you just, I can't tell you how many times I've said to people, um, basically what somebody's telling you isn't true. I always tell them, follow the money. If your youth soccer guy is telling you, your kid has to just play soccer. I'm going to guarantee you that guy makes his money from year on soccer. If your AAU basketball guy is telling you they got to do AAU basketball all year round, I want to guarantee you that that AAU basketball guy. And I always tell people, hey, I'm in the same thing. I'm competing for your money. We compete for your dollar, just like everybody else does. But I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you that this is how it works. And I always look at people and say, look, I did it with my own kids. I kept my own kids. My daughter didn't play in a summer hockey tournament until she was 13 years old. She was a uh, summer July birthday. Every year, people would say, what, is she going to go here? Is she going to do there? Is she going to do that? And I'm like, nope. And they'd be like, oh, she's going to fall behind. And I'd be like, no, she's not. And when she was 14, she was taking college visits at 14. She hadn't turned 15 yet. She was already visiting colleges. By the time she was 15, she had a full scholarship in college. And she had never been on the circuit. She'd never been, you know, everywhere. These other kids might have spent five more years going to tournaments than she did. And I just told people, I'm like, no. Nah. She's going to actually do swim team this summer. One summer she picked up diving because she would just go and throw herself off the diving board. And the diving guy said, we need a U12 diver. I was like, this is your girl right here. I said, <laughs> you'll take, if you'll take her for two hours a week, I'll bring her here. Cause I'd bring, I said, I'd bring her anywhere, <laughs> bring her anywhere that somebody would occupy her for an hour out of the day. 
because she had way too much energy for me. But, you know, she won the summer championship in diving. I took her to judo because people said get her involved in martial arts. She won the state championship in judo. It's like take your kids lots of places, have them do lots of things. that Parents don't want to hear it. I tell them anyway. We probably lose some clients because of it. But I always think I, I said this when I very first opened my business. I will not be a slave to these parents. I will not be a slave to the money. I will, you know, if people think they can buy you, then you're done. You've sold, you, you literally have done it. You've sold yourself out and they'll just look and think, all, all I got to do is offer Mike enough money and he'll do whatever. He'll take my eight year old and he'll do one-on-one -on -one training sessions and he'll do this stuff. And we're just like, not happening. Love it. Okay, we're gonna move into some Q and A. This one's first one's coming from one of our speed labs. Um, if you coach team sport versus individual performance, do you find in team sport that you have to put the team first, which shorts the individual athlete? Uh, how do you balance this, and how do you still make it about the athlete? Well, since I'm a team sport guy, uh, you you absolutely do that. But but a team is also a collection of individuals. Um, uh, we treat track and field as a team sport. We focus on, we love the relays. They're like the religious part of our sport because it's a shared performance. Um, we, we care about team standings at the end of the meet. We, yeah, we want to be proud of our team. Now that is, um, totally dependent on how fast our fastest guy is or how far our best uh, shot putter you know, throws the shot. So, so it, it is a collection of both. And I think that's great training for kids because, you know, it's a, you know, I, I believe that life is a team sport made up of individuals and, uh, and, and we have to work together and the sum, we want the sum of the parts to be greater than the, than the parts, you know? So, so uh, um, I love that stuff. And I love that challenge because, um, it's, it's weird. People really want status, individual status, but man, in our DNA, deep down, we, we want to belong to a team and excel with a team too. I a hundred percent agree. I always say the individual generally suffers for the group. That's just reality. And the truth is if you're coaching team sport, if you want to get better, you got to be thinking bell curve and you got to be coaching the 60% in the middle. You may have 20% of the kids that just aren't going to be able to contribute and you, you have to realize, okay, I can't spend too much time on them. And then you may have 20% high performance who you realize they're going to do really good if I don't spend any time with them. But the way my team will get better is if I get that 60% in the middle better. So you've got to be able to focus your energy there, whether you want to, or whether you don't. Plus the other thing is kids are, kids are super smart and super observant. And they know if you only coach the good kids. I've had people say that to me about coaches. So he only coaches the good kids. My favorite guys when I was a college strength coach were walk on. Some of my best friends, kids that I've had the biggest impact from a life standpoint were non-scholarship kids who came to Boston University to play football. And so I used to put, I used to say, I, I'm going to put as much energy into, if this kid shows up and wants to work out every day, I'm going to put every ounce of energy that I have into him in spite of the fact that he did not get a scholarship. And a lot of those kids, we had lots of kids over the time who ended up becoming team captains. One of my friends, actually, I think I think he's been in two so Super Bowls as a coach. But I talked him out of quitting his sophomore year. He was going to quit football. He was like, they don't even know they don't even know I'm here. He was a walk on kid. He was a he was a five nine offensive lineman. His name was David Dugliamo. He's coached all over the place in college in the NFL. And I said, you're the best athlete in the place. You can't quit. You're going to play here. And Initially, no one, I can remember our offensive line coach looking at us and saying, we can't have a five foot nine guard on our team. We can't win with him. The kid ended up being all East his senior year, all American, you know, captain of the team. And he would have quit football if it wasn't for that reinforcement. So you've got to, you have got to realize that it's the middle ground is where you're going to make up a lot of the, a lot of the ground, I guess. Perfect. Next one. This one might be a little more aimed towards Mike. From a weight room perspective, what would you say are three to five exercises that are a must in your training programs? If I was going to say three or five, three to five that are a must, I think everybody should be doing chin ups. I think everybody should be doing. I'm a hand clean guy. We can have the Olympic lift debate, but I would like everybody to be able to hand clean. I think from an upper body standpoint, 
I'm a bench press guy. I think it's still a pretty good indicator of upper body strength. I love trap bar deadlift. So unfortunately, that's four, and I haven't even got a unilateral exercise in there, which is what everybody thinks I'm known for. But And then I'd think you got to get some kind of one-leg squat. You got to get some sort of single-leg posterior chain. So I might have to go six, but yeah, it's definitely five. Right. Tony, anything to add on that? Or you're like, keep me out of that? Yeah, just sprint. <laughs> okay, sweet. <laughs> Um, well, that's what's funny. But some people might say that that's not that's not looking at sprinting as a weight room exercise. So that yeah. with that said, the number one, if someone said number one, number one thing you got to do is run sprints. But I'm not looking at that as a weight room exercise. I'm not sure. looking at that. We could say it's a plyo, or whatever, but I'm looking at it as it's its own thing, and it has to be done. And and I, I kind of said that just to throw throw uh, kind of a joke out there, but but. I, I do think that sprinting improves strength. And I think that sometimes people who are weight room centric don't understand the that you can gain strength in things that do not include weights. And so so when we're doing plyos, when we're doing uh, sprinting, when we're doing, uh, yeah, things outside of the weight room, we can get strong in that way as well. I mean, it's, it's probably your ultimate speed strength exercise it's your ultimate plyometric exercise and we've been through i mean obviously if you tell people have read your stuff tony there's nothing that you're going to do that's going to cause more rapid muscle contraction than maximum velocity sprinting which is that's what it creates the necessity when you think about it it goes back i loved uh jb marin's uh, article about um sprinting as vaccine he called it and he said you want to vaccinate your hamstrings against hamstring injuries then you got to get guys sprinting and i 100 percent believe that and and i love that that rapid contraction and what's hardly ever said is the rapid relaxation that must go along with it that you know that that we don't we don't train that when we squat but when we have that nanosecond contraction that coincides with the nanosecond relaxation that is really important because, as you know, hamstrings do not get injured in the contraction phase. Hamstrings get injured when you are lengthening a contracted muscle. And so if you're not able to shut off that contraction really, really fast, then you are lengthening a contracted muscle and it tears or gets strained or something. So, um, so yeah, in order to teach that frequency of contract relax, you have to do something other than lift weights. Perfect. Cool. We got a lot, a lot of great questions in here. Um, so the next one I kind of wanted to hit on is even though we kind of talked about just getting the athlete sprinting, I'm still getting questions on seems like towards front side mechanics at top speed. Are there specific cues or ways you've been able to help athletes get a, a better front side in their sprinting? Well, we just constantly talk about big in the front and big in the front to me is for knee up and foot out in front of the body. It's a, you know, that doesn't happen when you're running a 5k never happens. Not one time does the knee ever get up with the foot way, you know, like 24 inches off the ground in that power position. And then we say, not only do we want to get big in the front, but we want to be short in the back. And, and, you know, people, when they sprint typically do this naturally. And we also want to have full range of motion in the arms. I think that helps us to gain full uh, uh, full range of motion in the hips because your, your your thighs have got to split. And then, you know, we try to stay tall, you know. So we definitely don't overcoach it, but there's not a day that goes by that my guys don't hear those things. And And I think a kid that's been with me for two years could probably sprint, could probably coach a sprint group because they've heard things so many times. And I totally agree that you cannot cue a guy into doing things right. So I, you know, we do a lot of mini hurdles as well. And I think that when you video athletes and show them video, it internalizes what they're doing and it makes sense what you're telling them. So um, I would say, you know, don't be afraid to do wickets and, uh, and you can do that in a short space. And, and always remember that we all always have that iPhone with us and we can video. 
uh, two things. I'll, I will reiterate the wicked thing. A lot of sometimes for us, we don't have the time and the space to get in. I love if you, if you want to get guys running better, run wickets. We don't use many hurdles for our guys. We flip the hurdles down and because our guys, as soon as we put even that six inch hurdle up, it's amazing how many of them start high stepping over it. But I have not, I don't have the zero track guys. All I have are team sport guys. The other thing we did is we bought the old fashioned acceleration ladders that we used to use years ago. And we created wicket ladders out of those so that we can lay them down fast. And we did that off of Vince Anderson's charts. So we kind of charted it out based on height. So if you came in, we've got a five foot, five, six ladder, five, nine ladder, um, a six foot ladder, a six foot three ladder, and you line up on the ladder based on what your height is. And then we adjust you. If you look like you're reaching to get over, we may move you down a ladder, even though technically you're you're of the right height. So I'm a big believer in wickets. But I'm also, I go back, Tony's probably read Most Likely to Succeed, I'm going to bet. But um, the book Most Likely to Succeed was written by a, a guy, Ted Dinneman, who's an education consultant from Boston. And in it, he talks about bicycling. And he said, if we taught bicycling in school, the kids would learn every part of the bike, but nobody would ever ride a bike. He said they'd know about derailers and they'd know how many gears were on each sprocket and how many links there were in the chain. And we'd quiz them and, and then you'd put the bike out and no one could ride the bike. And Andy Bird would say, well, how do you learn to ride a bike? And my kids learned to ride a bike. I put them on a bike and I gave them a push and I yelled pedal. And that's how they figured out how to ride a bike. So I'm still a big believer. You want kids to run better, time them. They will figure it out. Trust me. Because somebody will look, and I can remember my son, the first day we timed a sprint, he looked at me, he goes, Dad, I'm slow. I said, you're right. I, I said, you are slow, but you will get faster. And he got, I mean, his his change in whatever, four or five year period was dramatic. And I will tell you, 98% of what we did was run sprints. Not a whole lot more than that. I think it's amazing people will think, but can't you teach them to do it better? I'm like, well, how would you teach them to do it better when they can just do it and get better at it? Just all you got to do is stay. I just stand there and I'm like, push, push the ground hard, push, 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 push. Hey, that that's probably, I say that probably more than anything that I say to anybody during the course of a sprinting session, push the ground. Love it. Okay. I'm going to give you guys 30 seconds each on this one, which is going to be incredibly hard. Um, what is the best way to get coaches of other sports to understand the importance of strength and conditioning uh, training for all athletes? So, Tony, you go first. <laughs> well, you better have the power of persuasion. Um, it, it, without the charisma and the knowledge to change minds, you're not going to be very successful in anything you do. So, generally speaking, you, you better be able to present quickly to answer questions well and i don't know any way to get good at that other than by doing that a lot and and then i i, I think that um uh, that you have to have some gifts you know of, of of communication and and probably the final thing is i think we learn by stories i'm constantly i know mike does the same thing i'm constantly telling stories to illustrate a point you know and and i, I think that people learn by that and they Get, they are persuaded by that. Awesome. Um, I think I always think to have a story about people above me. Like I always say to people like now it's Christian McCaffrey, right? If you want to talk to the football coach, just talk about Christian McCaffrey. Cause he's going to look and be like, like, do you want guys like Christian McCaffrey? Yeah. So when my friend, Josh Bonital was coaching, doing basketball, strength and conditioning at Purdue, he was timing his guys length of court. And I talked to people, but look how good Purdue is doing. And Josh is really putting a big emphasis on timing his guys. You want to coaches, sport coaches are the biggest copycats in the world. All they want to do is figure out who's doing it and how do I copy them? And so you've got to be ready with your elevator speech based on, okay, what sport, like right now they were just saying, Caitlin Clark gained eight pounds lifting. Okay. If I want to get my basketball coach involved in the program, I'm going to be like, did you see that article about Caitlin Clark? She's in the weight room. She's getting bigger, man. She's shooting bombs. It's like, she's shooting from the, under the other basket for Christ's sake and scoring three points three point shots. You've got to have that sort of social proof power because uh, uh, one of my, my friend Rob Rogers said an expert is someone who has PowerPoint and is a hundred miles from his house. So it's like, you know, the fact that you're there 
automatically means you're an expert. Like with my kids, I'm not an expert. I'm Mark's dad. I'm Michaela's dad. That makes me way less of an expert. I can go to China and people think, oh my God, Mike Boyle's here and we're going to listen to him talk. Right. My own kids are like, Mark's dad's here and he's talking about training again. And they're like, <laughs> and I've had people, I have my friends look at me like, they'll stumble across one of my books. Like, you wrote a book? And I'm like, I wrote a bunch of books actually, but nobody around here knows or cares. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you guys um, for answering those questions. I thought this was amazing. We have a ton of comments on here um, that we weren't able to get to. So, yeah, we only have 40 guys... questions. So, I, uh, yeah, we got we got a lot we got a lot on there. So if you guys have any questions that weren't answered, you can always uh, click the link in the chat and schedule something with our USR team, and then we can help either answer those or facilitate you guys over to Mike and Tony. I know uh, at least Tony and my personal experience has always been open into helping me with quick questions, and I hit him up on Twitter. So, um, Mike, are you open you to that as well? Same. Yeah, got to break that. I got to cool. break that seventy five thousand followers thing. So. Ask me some questions. Perfect. 75,000 followers. I got 73, five. I want to get to 75. So that's, Good but I've been on since the early, I was an early adopter. You got to realize younger guys like me are early adopters to social media. The, the older guys like you are different. Older. I'm only a couple <laughs> months older you, than you. you. You're older than me though, right? You're the older guy. A couple guys. months though. Come on, man. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Thank you guys for tuning in. All right. And, thanks. Uh, Tony, thank you for doing yeah. this. I always, I, I love having a chance to do anything that involves you. So I appreciate all that you Likewise. have done. Likewise. I said, and I'll say this right now before we sign off, the largest impact in the last 10 years of my coaching career has been Tony Holland. No question in my mind. So you're doing good work, sir. Thank you so much, Mike. Awesome. You're a legend, man. Thanks, guys.